The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene, and hello, everybody, and welcome to show number 22 of As We See It, being recorded on Sunday, December 18th, 2011. Before we get started with our first topic of conversation, which will be a rehash of one of last week's stories, um, joining myself here today from Boston, Massachusetts, we have Fred Boaz out there in the Poconos in Pennsylvania, and Holly Hurley in St. Louis, Missouri. She hasn't gone on her journey for the Christmas holidays yet. What we're going to do first on our agenda here today is I'd like to just readdress a topic that we covered last week regarding the triple X domains uh, that Fred brought up is, I believe, his first topic of conversation last week. Uh, This week, we have a special guest with us, Kate Hutchinson, who is with United Domains in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I figured that we might be able to get a little professional opinion on the XXX domains and on some other domains that are going to be coming out at the first of the year. Um, So, Kate, welcome. And Holly, it's all yours. (laughs) Thanks. It's very nice to be here, Ed. Awesome. Well, we're so glad to have you. So basically, we were talking about, you know, a lot of uh, universities were buying up the triple X domains. Um, and we were just sort of wondering sort of what the thought is in the business of this new domain name and will it help isolate porn, first of all. And then second of all, you know, these universities buying up these sites. Are they within their right? Is every company going to have to do this going forward? We'd just love to hear what you think about it. Oh, wow. There's there's a lot of questions in there. Um, in terms of, I mean, Triple X was designed to promote and sort of segment pornography on the internet. And not, not even just pornography, but even adult services. Like, um, if you actually go to the website, um, icmregistry.XXX, which is the company that designed this domain name, you can read that if you want to have one of these domains, you want it to be an active site, you have to be a member of what they call the sponsored community, which means you have to be either in the adult entertainment industry or providing services for it. Or so this, this could include anyone who, you know, a makeup artist for adult films would be able to have one of these sites active. So I think there's a lot of confusion in the general public about what they're supposed to do. It's for an entire industry. It's kind of like zoning for the internet. If you, if you were to think of it that way. Um, So with, with the development of the domain over about 10 years that they worked to develop this, um, the company that promoted the domain and applied for it put in a whole lot of work researching what were people's attitudes toward this, how could it be used, how could it be misused, how could you prevent misuse. And one of the ways that they were able to launch this domain was to say, we will build in protections for people so that you can say, I don't want to be associated with this and I don't want anyone to go register my name. And I think universities have been the focus of a lot of news stories recently that they have been registering names. I don't, I'm don't. i not going to give out client names, but I have seen in our orders, there are several universities who have ordered from us, you know, university name dot triple X. And honestly, I think it's a smart idea because in the domain industry, people do buy domain names for purpose of investing in them, developing them and monetizing them. And let's let's be honest pornography the adult entertainment industry has a fascination with college girls so to you know pick up your university name dot triple x and make sure that nobody's going to use it it is a smart move and honestly in the long run if you look at what you do online marketing your brand um or your company or whatever whatever you spend on it it's not a huge spend um I know one college was reported recently they bought $3,000 worth of domain names. That sounds like a lot of money, but one, it was a major university. I can tell you that's a drop in the bucket of their marketing budget. But two, they bought a lot of names. They were covering all of their bases. So you're buying, you know, 
let, let's pretend we're using Harvard because everyone knows that name. So you're not just getting Harvard.XXX, you're picking up Harvard University.XXX, Harvard-University.XXX, and so forth. So by covering all those bases, yeah, it does increase your costs, but it's still, for a major university, it's a smart investment to make sure no one's going to take that name. And, you know, it's also honestly not a huge spend for those universities when you look at what they spend on online advertising and Kate, marketing I materials. Absolutely. Okay. I have a question now. But now the question I got two questions actually. For a company the size of BaseNet, that mm-hmm. is a huge investment. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, but well, why should we as a company have to purchase those names? We should be the ones to authorize what names go on to what domain. If we have basenet.net, basenet.org, whatever, basenet.triplet, we are authorized to be sold, should never be able to be sold is it to anybody just out there for because they can because they can buy it. I understand the question and I think basically <sighs> Nobody owns domain names to begin with until they are registered. So when you, you know, when .com was launched, everyone had to sign up to get, you know, google.com, etc. I mean, there's a lot of startups these days that pick pick their company names by what's available as a domain mm-hmm. name for registration. And if you want to go ahead and say I own basenet.com, I own basenet.net, I own basenet.us.co, whatever extensions you own it in, you know, you can go ahead and collect them. And for companies that are trying to create a solid online presence, I highly recommend getting your name in every available. My question is, should they have to? Should they have to? A basenet.co, basenet.com, basenet.whatever, that's all fine buying it. But, I mean, how many many of these things do we need to purchase to keep the porn industry from buying basenet.xxx? And we shouldn't have to buy that. That should not be available. Unless, you know, if you don't have a reason, just like you have to be in the industry that is dot .xxx, you should have to be part of BaseNet or BaseNet's IT department or Pepsi or, or, or yeah. Coca-Cola I, to be able to I, buy these things. I guess, but that's the nature of the beast, I guess. I guess to stick in my two cents, Kay, um, oh, well, I, con- I, I, contact, I, contact I can, don't contact you you know uh well, they, it's, it's a common frustration right. it really is and in some ways what i think about triple x is that because it is a sponsored it has a specific function unlike dot com or dot net which are real generic domains dot triple x is specifically for one thing and if you i mean a company like basenet as as a domain name basenet dot triple x would probably have very little value it's not a, a term that is related to right. the pornography industry, and um, it's not a major company that somebody would think that they could squat on the name and make something off of it. I, I think that a lot of the misunderstanding from the public is that everyone has to either get it as a live site or, or block it, and you don't. If you have a reason to, for example, I had calls from a couple of trademark lawyers who had custom, who had clients and their product name was something that was completely innocuous, but if you wanted to think of it that way, you could. And that does happen with domain names. I'm sure if you go on the internet and look up hilarious domain names, you'll find out like penisland.com looks like penisland.com so when Fred, you put well, all Fred, one on, plane, on so. last week's show Fred used the example of with his stepson of bj's.com you know yep. meaning the wholesale yep. box store um, his stepson didn't get bj's.com warehouse well he did he but he didn't that. get the one he wanted <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no see that's the kind of person that's the kind of company or name that would benefit from the company saying, okay, I would like this as triple X. Um, well, but that, but that BJ's.com being at this company called BJ's warehouse should not be available for, I mean, and I'm not talking about dot, dot triple, dot triple X is a, is a certain thing, but I remember when dot edu was specifically targeted to educational mm-hmm. organization, OIG, why is dot com not registered to companies or, Got net to certain to networks and things like that. I mean, that would make more sense than anything else, but that's a whole different argument. No, I, you're absolutely on the money. And what originally dot com was intended for commercial 
endeavors and dot net was for networks dot org was for organizations but when they were created there were no restrictions placed on registrations for those for dot edu there is a restriction if you want a dot edu domain you must submit to the registry that you are an accredited educational institution so okay. it, not anyone can register. It's like .gov. You have to prove that you are right. somehow associated with the U.S. government to get and one of those. they're doing that with XXX or no? With .xxx, if you want a live site, you do have to go through a verification process to say, I am a part of the adult entertainment industry, and I am going to be using this domain for those purposes. If you were well, to I, say, But I can buy MGM.xxx and not be MGM. As long as I'm part of the adult industry. If it's available, now, if it's you can buy it. If right? it's available. Yes. And that should, not be allowed. <laughs> that should not be allowed, though. But the point... It, what, <laughs> what you, it's, it's a difficult point. I, I understand what you're saying. This shouldn't be available. But the point is that MGM, that's a, a difficult thing to manage online because it could be Metro Goldwyn May or the movie company. It could be... Um, there used to be a trucking company in New Jersey called MGM Trucking. Oh, I see. Oh, I see that. Oh, I could have a company with uh, two friends, and we could be, you know, Martin, Grant, and Maria. And you well, know, I, no, I understand what you're saying, but we all we all know some of you MGM dot XXX. We know what they're doing. They're exploiting the MGM name. But you don't necessarily that know that. I mean, there could be a legit company that's MGM that sells. Something related to the adult entertainment industry. There, there could be a a company mm -hmm. that provides casting. That's MGM Casting or something. The point it's like anything. Any when you come up with a company name, if you don't buy a domain name, you know you could think of anything. But I'm willing to bet there's another company out there with that name, and there's only one domain name. There's yeah, only we use, using BaseNet as the example since we've talked about it. We do not own BaseNet.com. It's owned by some advertising company or something uh, in the Netherlands, believe it or not. They didn't get like an NE website. They went with the .com. Um, so we can't even get BaseNet.com. That's why we have BaseNet Co. And then some variables. We have BaseNet Intermedia, BaseNet Network, you know, .coms. Now, sort of going along with this, I, I just want to get back to your point about what you were saying. Why isn't it .com for this, well, for commercial networks? Why isn't that anymore? It's because over the years, people have sort of, it's, it's a mature market. People have said, I want a website. It's going to be on .com because everyone knows that name. And, you know, but next, starting in January, ICANN is going to be launching applications for their new GTLD program. And there are going to be hundreds, possibly thousands of applications for new domain endings that many are proposed to have restrictions, like what you are saying, why can't, like for .edu. So um, some of the most popular are like .hotel. So you would know if you went to a site that ended in .hotel, it would be a site for if, a hotel. If like you're not a hotel, you're not going to get that .hotel. Right. That that's right, and that's how it should be. Mm-hmm. So there, there's there's other other ones there's um and all of them have different purposes. It's a great way for people to innovate about them. I'm Any very, other interesting ones coming up that you know? Uh, yeah, one of my personal favorite applications is actually for .hiv, and what it will do is they're going to be asking major corporations like Google to purchase them, and they're going to be using click-based crowdsourcing. So if you went to Google.hiv in their proposal, this is they, they have a lovely presentation that I've seen a couple times, that you would go to Google.hiv and you'd be able to search Google and so forth, but for every click on an HIV-based domain, a few cents would be donated to a larger fund, and that fund mm -hmm. would be used to promote research and give grants to people working to eradicate AIDS, which that's a fabulous innovation. That's in my a great opinion. idea. How about... I would like that breast cancer. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you, you could. Yeah. Um, and there's other commercial based ones. There's uh, one called Dot Shop. There's a couple people who are going to apply for that. And various people that I've talked to have indicated that Dot Shop domains will be more than, say, a dot com because they will come with built in security measures that they will require. Your site, if you're going to have a dot shop, you're going to have to have a secure shopping cart. You're going to have to have, you know, if you're going to be a shopping site, you're going to provide security for it. So there there are some out there that I think are kind of 
Well, I'm not sure how many people you're going to get interested in that. I know I've seen Dot Horse. I'm not sure how many people <laughs> want a Dot Horse. But, um, and you know, then, I, I've we been, gotta, we, we got to get one of those, man. I like the example of the Dot TV, which we don't have any of right now, but we're going to suck up a couple of those. Um, the Dot TV is for the island nation of Tuvalu. Um, yeah. You know, nobody thinks of it of dot TV being dot Tuvalo. No, it's just oh, geez, it's a dot television. Right. There's actually, you know, a lot of country code domains like that that have reinvented themselves for the purpose of, um, you know, bringing more money to the local economy. Um, so yeah, dot TV is one. Um, dot me that many people yep. now know. Uh, that's for Montenegro, mm -hmm. and that provides a lot of money, a lot of revenue. That'd for the be a great. That'd be a great with the personal websites. Exactly. Um, and even you've got .co, that's a new, newly treated as a generic domain, but it's actually the country code for Colombia. So. Um, that's had a huge response. Um, it's been a great marketing campaign. Um, Juan Calais, the um, VP, no, he's the CEO of .co Internet. He's, uh, he's done a fabulous job. I met him at an ICANN meeting in San Francisco this year. And just, it's really great to see people making that kind of diversity. Um, I mean, domain names, if you want a .com, it's hard. There's over 92 million .com names registered. And, you know, some Yeah, and if them... you are a startup, like you said, you really need to do your research and your homework. And if you want to associate your business name with a .com, start planning on spending hours of doing research. But, and, you know, and I've seen a whole bunch of other startups choose country code domains. Um, if you think about, like, Delicious, when Delicious started out, it was a .us, US. Yep. Um, which is a lot cheaper um, than, you know, buying someone else's used, probably whatever Delicious.com was originally worth. Or um, there's a, a lot of the link shorteners are using .ly, which is Libya. Um, and although that can pose some interesting questions, uh, Libya has some rules about when it finds certain things on its domains, it will take them away. And one of the most notorious cases was there was uh, the writer Violet Blue, who is um, an adult columnist, and she used vb.ly as a link shortener for adult content because Bitly and Owly will filter it out. And when the Libyan government got wind of that, they actually yanked the domain. They did more than filter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they said, you can't have that domain anymore because um, it doesn't hold up to the moral standards of our country. So, um, so there is sort of a danger with the country code domains and some of them also can be quite expensive. Uh, like, um, I'm sure you've all heard of dot FM for radio stations. That's the Federated States of Micronesia. And those can go depending on where you go upwards of $70 a year. Yeah. Even so, the dot TVs oh, are not cheap. Dot TV is cheaper in general, but okay. it, it, you know, it depends on where you buy them. Right. Oh, no, sure. Um, okay. Well, before we uh, wrap up and we'll let you uh, have your little plug for United, um, back to the triple X. So to clarify what we were talking about last week and what we were talking about today, the gist of our conversation last week was, as Fred had said, universities specifically buying up these dot triple X. So ultimately, in your opinion, should companies be worried uh, and go out and buy the different variations of the dot triple X or they don't need to, or, you know, what, what would be our closing opinion on that? Uh, my last word is if, if there is a way for somebody to twist your name or representation around, like say a, a college site with, you know, as, as I mentioned before, sort of the adult fascination with college girls. I mean, how many Playboy editions have you seen about, you know, college co-ed? So yes, I think for universities, it's a smart move. Um, but in terms of other companies, I know Microsoft has bought and blocked its triple X. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I can't think of anyone really making any money off of that no, I just, feel just that, as you would hold it against them or something hang it over their head and I say mean, hey it, we're it, microsoft triple x yeah it's like it's like it's like sears triple x or pepsi nobody's gonna think that these right. people are actually be legitimately supporting that kind of thing. So, right. on the other end it is kind of silly i mean i understand both sides of it 
No, I, I think the people who really need to worry, I mean, would be uh, celebrities, although a number of those, um, one thing that ICM Registry did do when it launched is it held a certain collection of words, names, phrases in reserve that would never be able to be touched to, in order to, you know, okay. so Jesus dot triple X has been barred for whatever. Nobody can ever do that. That was okay. never a- available to anybody ever. Um, okay. So, and I know that there were a handful of celebrities that um, poor there's... poor Jesus. Jesus can't even get his own domain. <laughs> huh? yeah. and, he, and he's in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> so he was in the industry. He's one to have his last name anyway. You know, Jesus six feet long dot xxx or you know accordingly. <laughs> but you know, uh, I, I think you know some of what you said sounds a lot like what I said last week, which is you know when it comes to domain names like this, and, and it has always been this way, especially when porn did have access to regular, or you know when when porn was as simple as not trying to differentiate itself having dot com, it's a cost of doing business. Well I have to want to domain name. I'd also say there's one benefit that a lot of people um haven't noticed to triple X domains, which is that all of them are scanned by um, McAfee software for viruses and they have certain security standards and so I, you know, anyone knows that you go out on the internet, you're going to find phishing scams and sites, but a lot of them do live on dot-com porn sites where, oh, sign up to see, you know, send me your credit card and I'll show you the pictures. And you will never, ever have to worry about that with um, a dot triple X site because they are all scanned and verified and they do keep a tight leash on them. And the point is to create a safe e-commerce environment for this. So... I think some of the outcry is really just due to the fact that Americans have a difficult time talking about and, and there you go. The, attitudes. The, the majority of the, well, let's call it the porn industry, is legitimate. It's a legitimate industry um, in this country or worldwide. So that being said, of it being a legitimate industry within itself, by making the putting such tight reins on the .xxx domain, just falls in with the legitimacy, like you said, if you are going to provide a credit card number, should you choose to buy that product? Yeah. Well, that'd be the way to go if you want to. Yeah. Well, and I actually think this is a really good thing because I do feel, I, I am one of those people who firmly believes that this sort of thing should exist for adults who want to access this sort of thing. And I think it should be regulated in that way because it should be safe for them to practice, you know, as they want to in this arena in a safe way for both their computer and their financial information. And why should you automatically have to worry about getting a virus should you choose to visit those types of sites? Make them a little safer just for casual surfing. No, it's true. I and it, it also tells you exactly what's on that site. If I mean, nowadays, if you visit a .com, you could find a shopping site, you could find a magazine, you could find someone's personal website, you can find a photo gallery, whatever. This is a domain that identifies specifically. This is what you're going to you get. You know what you're going to get. All right. Well, thanks very much for all of this insightful information. This, uh, you gave us more than I think we were expecting. And why don't you go ahead and uh, give a little plug for United Domains? Oh. Great. Yeah. United Domains, we're a domain registrar. We're based in Cambridge, so we're local. <laughs> um, you can find our website at uniteddomains.com or for short, ud.com. And additionally, if you want to find out more about new top level domains that are coming out like .hiv or .green or .hotel, we do have a section devoted to what they are and you can actually pre-register some of those names if you're interested. Great. Kate Hutchinson, United Domains, thank you very much for joining us today on As We See It. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Well, that was great. It was uh, great for Kate to join us today from United Domains. And uh, Holly and Fred, what do we have first on our regular agenda? Well, unfortunately, this week we actually have some more Sandusky trial news. Um, we actually have Tim Curley came forward, the former athletic director, and uh, also Gary Schultz, and they've been charged with perjury uh, for failing to report it uh, based on something that was said in the court case. Basically, there was a description of what happened, the actual scene that, you know, that 
basically Sandusky was caught in the act of, and it's, it's kind of disturbing. Perjury for the for these two guys, I don't know, but I, I know that perhaps allowing it to go on, enabling on some level, you know, maybe, but I, I don't know about perjury. What well, do you think, they, they, they lie on the stand. They have perjury. I don't know if anything else. Well, exactly. Well, they said that they're bringing them in uh, basically for failing for failing to report the allegation. But well, according to perjury. Yeah, yeah, no perjury as well. Because they're they're basically saying uh, the testimony on Friday. Who did he lie to? Well, the, well, it says that McQuer- that McQuarrie told university officials uh, that he saw that he saw something that was extremely sexual in nature. But they're saying that he left out some important details. Uh, that's not perfect, but that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, Curley, of course, said that he wasn't made aware of any sexual activity. And so he said it may be inappropriate, but he didn't have any evidence that it was sexual. So basically everybody had a, apparently one small part of the story, but no one had the whole story. Which, yes, they can say in court, but I think maybe people are making the argument that perhaps this is just their way of uh, alleviating their own guilt in this situation. And before we go any further, I just want to apologize to everybody about audio quality today. You may hear an echo throughout. Uh, Skype is having some issues today, and we use Skype a lot on the show, as well as Fred is uh, joining us via phone today. So Fred will sound like he's on the phone. But anyway, uh, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to give that disclaimer in case people were adjusting their dials, as we used to say. Go ahead, guys. Their dials? Um, now, Fred, did you get a chance to read the article? Yeah, I read the article, and I'm not, and I'm not happy with the way what they're doing with this. But they, they got to, you got to understand, they, the people want blood, they want somebody's heads to roll, and they're going to hang Sandusky, and they're going to hang everybody involved with it, because if you saw it and didn't report it, they're going to consider it, you know, it, it, it's a violation, but it's not perjury. Yeah, and I have exactly. a problem with that. And I, have, I have a problem with it, but, you know, it, it's, these people, these people saw something happen. They didn't stop the guy from doing it. They're not telling what's going on. That's still a mission. When you go to a grand jury omitting uh, uh, testimony, it's not perjury, but you know, maybe, I, I mean, maybe I'm not that, that versed on it, but maybe it is perjury. It might, might consider perjury yourself by, by a live omission type of thing. It was exactly. And I think, I mean, uh, the description that McQuarrie gave was, I mean, just really upsetting but you know the guy has to say exactly what he saw and the other guys have to say exactly what they heard you know they can't make it sound like they knew more than they did know because then that's actual perjury you, you can't know leave it out I mean, either yeah exactly they i mean i i don't want them not to be held responsible for what they actually did or did not do but i but along those same lines in a court of law, no one wants this case to be thrown out, and they can't. They cannot say more than actually happened. And, that, and that's, that's what people. That's what people have a problem when they're in court. You got to tell them what you know, what you saw, what you heard, and don't make and don't read into it. Exactly, and I think that's the best that they can do. So, you know, omission. I doubt it. Perjury, as at this point, I don't see any proof of that. But I do think that everyone should be held responsible for their part in this. And I'm sure they will be in one way or another by the end of this. Because, as you said, people are looking for heads to roll, and they're going to find a way to make it happen. Let's move on to a lighter topic. Let's. A much lighter topic, in fact, considering I believe this is her third engagement since her time in the limelight. Britney Spears got engaged this week. And oh, we here we go, Fred. We're back to entertainment news this week. We got a clip from E! News. Hey, something in entertainment happens every week. It happens to be news. You can't hold that against me, guys. Uh, but here's, uh, here's what the report sounded like on entertainment news earlier this week. Britney Spears is engaged. A source tells E! Britney is set to say I do for the third time after her agent BF Jason Trawick popped the question. On Friday morning, the superstar hinted at the news, tweeting, OMG, last night Jason surprised me with the one gift I've been waiting for. Can't wait to show you. So, so, so excited. The couple, who have dated since 2009, will celebrate their engagement this weekend in Las Vegas. 
so there it is. She's just so, so, so excited. <laughs> Aren't you so, okay. so excited? Is this number two or number three? How many times number she's been three. 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 Yeah, he's, he's, he's 40, she's 30. So, you know, and, it, and that doesn't mean, it's just, you know, here's okay. the, here, she's getting married again. Good yeah, for Brittany. I mean, I mean, you know how the, there there's a lot of, I know, etiquette talk about these sort of weddings, but, you know, by the time you get to number three, it's like, is it really a big deal anymore? Hey, if, 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 if Kevin said the one became k fed does this guy become uh, Mr., uh, the other Mr. Britney Spears? <laughs> Are they going to call him J-Trey or something? <laughs> <laughs> Or, or maybe they'll yeah. give them a full name. You know, they they can be Britwick or something. Uh, how about using the poor guy's real name? <laughs> you mean Jason Trowick? She doesn't become Mrs. Trowick, does she? I guess. Oh, I'm sure she won't. I mean, you know, for a while she wore the T-shirts that said Mrs. Federline, but has anybody ever called her that? Not really. Yeah, that's not going to happen. It's like when Madonna was saying that she was Mrs. Ritchie. I mean, look at how long that lasted. Yeah, exactly. With you know, the, uh, the British accent at the same time. Yes. You know, that, last, that lasted as long as her marriage to uh, Richie. Yep. Well, and you know, God bless him, because I know it's difficult to keep a marriage alive in Hollywood. You know, I hope this is the one, Brittany. I, I always wish the best for Britney Spears. I don't know what it is about her, but yeah, I want her to have better luck in life. I, I, think we feel, I think we feel less sorry for Britney than we do Lindsay. For some reason, well, it's almost like Lindsay has it coming to her, and we almost do feel sorry for Brittany. Yeah, but you know, the thing is that there are marriages in Hollywood that have lasted 30 or 40 years. So you can't really say that it's a Hollywood marriage here. We feel sorry for them. It's true, but I also, I find, and maybe I also, you know, really felt this way about Michael Jackson, but I also feel like it's more difficult for child stars because this is sort of the only life they've ever known. You know, and even when they were younger, there was a lot of pressure on them to perform. And well, look at the know, list of child stars that didn't make it past 30. I'll bet you there's over a dozen on that list. Exactly. Yeah, yeah they're, all on, they're all on that rehab show. Well, yes, they are. Yes, that's well, the ones that are still alive, actually, but I mean the ones that didn't make it past 30 that are long gone. Well, and oh, the yeah. other side of that coin is, you know, then the ones who do make it past 30, you wake up and you're not cute anymore and you don't have the thing to sell that you always had to sell. I mean, there's got to be a certain identity crisis. And I think we saw that with people, you know, like Wanaducci, who lived past that age where they're still in crisis today. Because they, they have no idea how to handle life on the other side of child stardom. So, hey, here's yeah. to Britney Spears. If all if the worst thing she does is get married three times. Good for her. Congratulations, yeah, right? anyway. Right, congratulations. We wish her luck. Well, and while we're on good news, bigger good news, much bigger good news, the war in Iraq is officially over, guys. Which means they're coming home, which means that we have a little, hopefully we're going to start saving a lot of money, which I doubt, but... At least they're coming home. Uh, I think we have a clip on this one, too, don't we? I think so. Eight years, a trillion dollars, 44 of our men and women dead, 32,000 wounded. Was this war worth it? Um, History is going to have to judge uh, that. I don't think uh, any of us can, uh, can judge that now. What we, uh, what we can say is that uh, our troops have performed remarkably over that period, and our diplomats uh, are doing the same. And the result of that is that today we're at a place where, as Dennis said, Iraq is emerging uh, as a secure, stable, and self-reliant country. And that, uh, that was President Obama's goal. Uh, but as to the rest, uh, that's really up to history. Well, yeah, so they're coming home, but what about the thousands, or it may even be in the tens of thousands, of advisors and security personnel from the United States um, not to mention the uh, the CIA types that are still in Iraq. It's not like everybody left. It's the ground well, troops, the troops on the the boots on the ground that left Iraq. There's also a lot more. There's going to be a lot. They're, they're, they're talking about leaving almost eight million, uh, eight eight uh, so eight million dollars worth of equipment in Iraq for the use of the Iraqi army, which is I don't know, kind of silly because I I I personally don't see that country going anywhere near what we have ever, and you want to turn it into a, if that country turns back into a, uh, not, not to not to piss people off, into a religious regime like the other countries in that area, we're going to wind up with, with getting, getting bombed with our own equipment. Well, I, I mean, 
Uh, my, my thought on, Ed, what you were saying is we have a CIA and an FBI. We have these government agencies for this reason, for international um, things that can't necessarily be done with full armies that need to be done on, in a more subtle manner. They have a similar system in every other country in the world. That's what they're supposed to be for. With these large-scale wars, you, we're not meant to be sending all of our soldiers abroad for everything that we think might eventually be a potential threat in the future, and we can't leave them there until everything is reconstructed. I mean, even in World War II, there is a limit to how long you can leave soldiers abroad, both financially and just for the good of that country and your country. You're two different countries for a reason. No, absolutely. Your soldiers and, have to come home. And Fred, that's you've you've known me, you know, forty years roughly. Um, one of my pet peeves forever has always been saying that we cannot be the world's policemen. I've I've said it on Viewpoint, our new show, and I know I've said it on As We See It. We cannot oh, be the world's policemen. So I, I agree with what you're saying there, Holly. That's not all. And we need to have, uh, these co- a lot of these countries, and, and to defend what they're doing, these countries need to start defending themselves rather than having our people over there. We're spending hundreds of millions of dollars every year supporting basing stuff over there as well. Well, and when it comes to things like that, I mean, there's a large level of fault, obviously, that lies within our country for sending our troops to these places in the first place. And I know that subject is highly loaded, but historically, and Afghanistan is actually a result of one time that we did this, that we sent troops into Afghanistan and we sent weapons into Afghanistan and we armed people that then eventually turned around and and came against us and they didn't want the Russians there any more than they want us there. And then it becomes a very complicated situation of, yes, we were trying to help, but how much help did we do? And then that help ending up poisoning us later, you know, being the reason that people want to bomb us later because we tried to help, you know, their country 30 years ago, you know, and this is a never ending cycle. And I think the longer you participate in a huge military way, with these sort of more subtle and underground problems abroad, the more the more bloodshed, the more money spent. You know, these these things have to be handled on a smaller level. As whether we like that or not, as a democratic nation, it's unfortunately the the nature of the beast. I mean, there's a lot to that because you know we have we have babies. My wife was born in Germany. What the hell are we still doing in Germany? You know. Yeah, and there's leftover from World War Two. Correct. Yeah, that's, I mean, so I guess, you know, more or less what we want to do is just welcome those guys home and say, man, we hope in the future they will be home. And I'm with you, Fred. I'm hoping this will result in spending less government spending. I hope and pray. I, you know me, uh, you know, I'm like you guys, I, I think sometimes we go on different sides of this, but I'm a huge supporter of the Obama administration. I hope this does help them prove that they're doing everything they can to cut spending. Well, and I'll tell you, whether it's Republican, Democrat, or a third party candidate, whoever is inaugurated in January 2013, that's going to set the course for the future, uh, regardless oh, yeah. of who it is. You know, who's, who's to say what direction we're going to go in and, until we find out who is sitting there as president in 2013. See, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of border security. Take those troops that are overseas and want money and now put them on the borders and let them guard the borders, keeping our country secure, and use that money internally to improve our structure and you improve our economy, create jobs and things like that. But bring these people home and let, let, them, let them man bases in the United States. The, all these bases were closing here. Yeah, I mean, my my hope and prayer is just that that money gets spent the right way. But I think, and I really think on both sides, there's got to, this stalemate that's happening in Washington has to end. You know, they were able to end a war. Let's end the, the discussion in the government over fixing the budget. Get together, erase party lines for a hot second, and get it done. Well, we could you know? very well be in Iran next, especially with the stupid drone issue. Um, for anybody that's been living under a rock, one of our drones went down in Iraq, in, in Iran rather, and um, part of the controversy is that the wheels were down on the drone after it crashed in Iran. Um, these drones do have retractable wheels, so everybody is saying that this drone crashed or was shot down and crashed in Iran. 
but there's photos and documentation that the wheels were down. So this drone landed. It did not crash land, number one. Number two, the only negative thing that I'll say about President Obama in the situation is that diplomacy didn't work in this case or would never have stood a chance to work in this case. Republican politicians were begging President Obama to demand the release of this drone back to us, you know, under dire consequences. And what did the president do? He says to Iran, could you please send us back our drone? And Iran, of course, said, you ain't getting your drone back. Oh, I'm sorry. okay, think, that's the end of it. I don't think getting the drone back is the answer, and I don't think starting a cockfight with Iran is the answer either. I think those drones, by the way, if you if you want to blame that on Obama, were developed under President Bush. They were sent out originally under President Bush, and the contractor that developed them, they knew when it was in development that they were very easy to override. The reason that it's an issue that Iran brought it down is because there's evidence that Iran overrode its internal system, which that's might right. Which, by the way, is a very, very simple bit of technology that my heart rate monitor can accomplish. So, You've got to understand that it's a government contract, and they put the cheapest bid. I mean, yes. this, is not, this, is, this is no secret. They didn't go to a bid where you could not override it because that would have cost too much money. And, of course, they got to put the money in their pockets rather than putting it into technology that actually works. Correct. And I'm sorry, if I was President Obama, I'd say, you know what, keep that cheap piece of crap drone. We don't want it back. No, you're just, you can't make a random statement like that because I don't know and I'm just assuming, and you know where assuming gets us, I'm just assuming you don't know. We don't know what kind of classified equipment was on that drone. So just to randomly say as outside citizens, keep the piece of crap, we don't know what kind of classified equipment they now have in their possession. And that's part of the problem with the software being able to be overridden by these guys, especially even if it doesn't have classified equipment. You, don't want, you want something that cannot be overridden. That's going to cost money, and nobody wants to spend it. Exactly. I'm sorry. I'm with Fred on that. This thing was too easy to override to begin right. with. If they were able to override it, they already have all oh, the I'm, intelligence I'm, on it. I'm also in agreement with that. I'm, I'm just saying that, and I am going to criticize the president for this. We, we have a right to criticize whoever we want to. And there's a lot that Obama does that I agree with him wholeheartedly. So on this one occasion, I'm going to um, not agree with him. I agree with a lot of these Republicans that just say that he wasn't forceful enough. Just to say, could you pretty please with sugar on top give us our drone back? And they say no, and that's the end of the conversation. Well, I'm sorry. On that front, Ed, I'm going to turn that right against you and say you don't know what Obama knows that they have or don't have. So your yeah. argument works both ways on that. You know, we, we, don't have, we don't have all the facts. No, we don't. None of us do. And if this is a simple, if this is a simple scouting drone with no... With no uh, with no classified information on board other than the, 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 no, the then you actual still say it shouldn't, have been over, it shouldn't have been in Iran, Iranian airspace in the first place. Right, show. exactly. So you can take that argument back several pages. No, the thing is this, though. Was it in Iranian airspace or did they override and bring it to Iranian yeah. airspace? There you go. No. There you go. Either way, our fault. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no I, don't, I, don't mean, I don't mean it that way. I'm just saying this, this is a statement that Ed just made. Was it in Iranian airspace to our fault or they, were they able to see this thing go and say, we'll see if we can bring it in? There you go. Very good right. question. Well, if it's able to be overridden, then they which can go, bring it which in. Goes back, which goes back to the override. Right. Yes, Cheap, cheaply made our fault. Yeah. But I mean, let's not get off the important point here. Our boys are home. We're really happy about it. Oh, and, yes. you know, home, and I think that's, you know, the best case scenario. And like I tell all the people I know, if you find a veteran or soldier, walk up to them and say thank you and walk away because they're doing a hell of a job for us. And it does mean a lot to them. I, the ones I know, at least, the ones I've talked to certainly appreciate knowing that. The, them putting their lives on the line meant something to the people they've protected. And don't forget the police officers, too. I saw it on Sunday they did that. Well, you know, Time Magazine said that the protester was their person of the, the year this year, and uh, it looks like something good has come of this because the SEC has finally made an accusation against the uh, the executives of Freddie May, uh, Fann Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac.
The charge is specifically that they misled investors about their firm's exposure to risky mortgages, uh, which was, of course, one. And this is the most uh, significant federal action that's been taken against the people responsible for the housing bust. This is hopefully, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the first of many of this kind of allegation. Mark, didn't this, didn't this the same uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that was buying up junk mortgages that Congress told banks they had to take? Yes, it is. Okay, I want to make sure we have a look. That the laws were changed so that the banks had to take these junk loans and Freddie Mac and, Fred and Fannie Mae had to insure them. So you can't blame Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae completely. You have to blame Congress who made the law in the first place. Well, the accusation from the SEC, the problem is, is that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were a big part of the reason that that had to happen. This is actually something that the SEC is making the allegation that they misled investors about the exposure of risk that these mortgages contained. So this is before they were forced to buy them all up because there was the problem that they were out there. This was when this was when they were actually saying, no, 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 these are good investments. These are fine to invest in. Without yeah. that, that would have never happened. Well, people don't know that. But I know a guy who worked down the street, you know, both him and his wife got a mortgage for $600,000 home and both of them together made 30000 a year. There's no way that was done. That was federally insured. And Newt Gingrich so. is answering an awful lot of questions related to this, too. This and he should be. And he should be. Well, and the problem is, is that these were, as you said, federally insured because... Um, I don't know if you guys there there I, I know we're not you know we're, we're not in the business of endorsing other people but there have been a lot of really good reports done on this and one of the ones that I heard earlier in the game before 2008 actually was uh, done by uh, this American life uh, by their financial reporters who now have their own show planet money they um, they actually went into the way that this process was built up and you know initially these uh, these investment professionals were bundling, these bad mortgages so that they looked like a low risk portfolio. And, you know, anybody who was looking at the situation, looking back could say, well, that's not a good investment. But the problem is these guys are making money hand over fist. So when you're making a ton of money, you're like, who cares if it crashes tomorrow? I'm going to take home all the money. And unfortunately, there were enough people doing this within these companies. And, you know, Franny, if Fannie and Freddie and all and, you know, and up, the big one actually is AIG. AIG was responsible for ensuring these big banks who were participating in this on a huge level. And, you know, you can't you know, if you're if you're AIG, you can't not, you know, uh, insure investments by say, Morgan Stanley, because there is this one portion that's doing something highly illegal. And because of that, this just bled all the way up to the top. Oh, and look at look at oh, some yeah. of the big companies that this brought down. Bear Stearns, for instance, you know, yes, which, yes, which the assets, or not that there were assets, but the remaining assets of Bear Stearns were acquired by uh, Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, <laughs> Bear Stearns, you know, a 130-year-old company or something, that got caught, caught up in this whole junk bond thing, and that's what brought down uh, Bear Stearns after 130 years. Well, and I'm, I'm really in love with the quote that, uh, that the agency enforcement chief for the SEC came out with that said, you know, individuals, regardless of their rank and position, are going to be held accountable for, per, for perpetuating these half-truths and misinterpretations about matters that were, he says, important to the interest of our country's investors. But I say, looking at where we're at right now, the world. Wasn't uh, Timothy Geithner involved in this? Everybody was involved. little Timmy Geithner, and everybody. The guy who, fi everybody the guy who forgot guy. the guy who forgot to pay his taxes and became the head of the Treasury Department. That Timothy Geithner, you know. Yeah, yeah, everybody, oh, oh. everybody loves little Timmy. Yeah, well, well, you know something. He should fly too. And I mean, you know, if if he if he. Well, I don't know if you guys he... watched the debates the other night. You know, asked about the Fed and the Treasury. Uh, the first thing you would do. Uh, fire Timothy Geithner. That was one of the first things uh, that was discussed. Well, if there's any evidence that Geithner had any uh, pre-crash knowledge of what was going on, then I'm sure he is going to be included on this list. But the problem, you know, the SEC took so long to respond to this. You know, the FBI has been doing a large portion of their job for a number of years now because, let's face it, the guys who work at the SEC really want to go out and become corporate lawyers and make a lot more money. They want to get recruited by these companies out of the SEC. So are they right. going to lead the kind of the kind of charge that they need to leave? 
Probably not for the same reasons that the guys who were doing these mortgages were, were not going to stop them because mm -hmm. they were getting raises and being pushed to the next tier and being forced by people in their company to do the bad mortgages. I mean, it's, it's, it's a self-perpetuating model starting at a very low level and trickling up to a very large level. So I'm just well, happy to see that at least one prosecution got through. Well, the system. Doing something. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. just so happy. But I don't understand why it took four years. I don't understand why the American public wasn't angry enough to start this a long time ago. And we haven't heard the last of it. Well, let's move into a, into a topic that I know Ed's going to enjoy because this is one of his favorites. Unfortunately, it's sad news, not happy news. Uh, apparently, the playbook is just demolishing RIM. Uh, you know, RIM has been one of the most successful technology companies for a very long time, which isn't an easy thing to do in that industry. You know, RIM makes BlackBerry. And uh, the BlackBerry playbook is just demolishing them. And uh, actually, I think we have a clip on this. Research in Motion revealed one of its worst kept secrets today. 2011 has been a bad year for the company, which has been one of the best known and most successful Canadian brand names in the world. But now profits for the struggling tech giant have plunged. And tonight its co-CEOs are facing new calls to quit. It's all left many wondering, can RIM rebound in 2012? Simply put, the company is now trading even below its book value, the value of its assets if the company was liquidated. Yeah, so in everything that I've been reading, they're blaming this on the playbook. Um, I, don't, I don't know. RIM's problem started long before the playbook. Um, the playbook was deemed to be one of its saviors now, and it didn't turn out that way. The playbook... For those of you who don't know, it, it's a tablet. And in its current version, it doesn't do emails. Uh, I don't believe they pushed that out. I think that that's part of still the problem. Um, it's not email capable. That's supposed to come through in the first upgrade. The first upgrade was supposed to have happened by now, and they pushed it off until sometime in 2012. So there's a lot more fuel on the fire for RIM. Um, they just missed the game here. Uh, they were too late into it. They, as the touchscreen market was coming in, going back to just touchscreen cell phones, RIM was way, way late to the game after Android, after the iP I iPhone. iPhone. And they came out with their first touchscreen product, which was a flop for various reasons. So... You know, RIM just missed the boat here. Now, yes, they could have potentially gotten themselves back into the game with the playbook. And to issue a tablet device that isn't full-featured and then to not get your upgrades that would bring the full features into play on your previously announced schedule and to push it off into 2012, ugh, what can I say? We, we have all, each of the three of us, have all used Blackberries for years and years and years. And it's a shame Never to see again. that it's going down this path. I had predicted at least three years ago now that within the next three to five years, RIM was going to be gone. <laughs> and you know what? Unfortunately, it looks like my prediction of three years ago is right on track. Well, no, the thing is that I was always I always follow the technology trend behind everybody else as well as you know now having an Android phone, but I had the I've had the BlackBerry loved the original BlackBerry had little blue the big blue one we had I loved those and when they were able to go on the internet I loved the idea behind that because I always liked the Blackberries but since I had the last one I don't want to have anything to do with them anymore it's Blackberries they're not technology they're not keeping up with the technology I mean I know people have cell phone and a BlackBerry. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And, you know, I would like to see Web say, hey, this is what these guys are doing. This is going to be short. And even if you cop some, copy someone else's technology they're all doing, come out with a similar technology that works as well as the stuff we're using now. Well, and the thing that BlackBerry always had, you know, the reason that people did carry the BlackBerry and then their cell phone was because the BlackBerry had a keyboard. That's why I stuck to my BlackBerry for so long. I still, even with my tablet, even with my laptop, I mean, the, even the touchscreen, you know, I am like you guys, I went from RIM to Android, which I think a lot of uh, BlackBerry users did. 
you I miss the keyboard. If my BlackBerry had any that's, that one. that's that's why that's why I specifically bought a Droid too because it's got the uh, slide out keyboard. Yep. And I just don't understand why BlackBerry couldn't give us the keyboard and because they were so ahead of the curve for so long. Why couldn't they stay ahead of the curve with you know with the technology and also give me a, a keyboard? But they the just got behind. That, that they're trying to depend on corporate and government contracts. I mean, the Postal Service and a lot of your larger companies are still using Blackberries. But so does the government. Using... President Obama but... carries a Blackberry. Well, hey, but what, but what are they going to do when, you know, they, those are going to become what? They're going to become strictly government contract. People never survive that way. I mean, if everybody else around is starting to go with Android and starting to go with uh, even even iPhones, I mean, I like the iPhone. I didn't like the idea of paying $100 a month for it, but I like the iPhone. I've always liked Apple products, as you know that. But I love my Android because it gives me everything it does, everything I want to do. And that's why, we, like we said in our, our previous show, these are the phones we talked about 20 years ago, and we should have listened. I'm going to uh, try to get somebody on one of our upcoming shows uh, from the tech industry to discuss um, yeah, like the whole that. rim situation in a little bit more detail. I think we could pursue this in a lot more detail as we just did today with uh, Kate and the Triple uh, X domains. So uh, hopefully we could head in that direction and we could pick this up again. Uh, oh, I like that. That would be great. Yeah, I think uh, I think we definitely have the right professionals to turn to for that. And this is an ongoing story. I mean, I know this is something that, you know, as you said, Ed, you predicted three years ago. We've been talking about this for four or five years now. You know, I mean, people saw it coming, you know. We saw The thing is, we saw it coming in the, in, in the, in the purchasing end of it. They didn't see it coming in the supply end of it. Right, which I don't understand how that happened, you know. And they're down 75% now. Oh, that hurts me. Well, well, speaking of things that are down 75%, uh, we have a lovely <laughs> and adorable uh, report coming out of Southern California. Um, there was a preemie, preemie baby born probably at about 75% of normal weight. She weighed in just over nine ounces. And, uh, well, you got to talk like she was born in August. Yeah, yeah, she was born in August, and uh, and basically the report is in today that she's the doctors are cautious, cautiously optimistic. She's been, you know, living and breathing, and she's just it's just really a medical miracle. She was uh, basically they said she was the size of a soda can. That's incredible. Two hundred seventy grams of birth the size of a soda can. Holly, you your, your dog that you adopted was never the size of a soda can. No, no, probably not. <laughs> and definitely not since I had him. I well, adopted him. Well, Melinda does well. Oh, That'd yeah. So, you know, I guess the uh, best thing to say is, you know, happy thoughts going out to California and hope that that little fighter keeps fighting. Absolutely. And we invite her on uh, as we see it for her 20th birthday or something. So I suppose then I guess we're going from new life to... Uh, to the end of many, uh, to the end of many lives. I guess it's Obit's time. Oh, and to that point of the well, show already, huh? Well, yes, absolutely. And for our first Obit here, we're going to go ahead and come in with a clip, and I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, the controversial British-born author and journalist Christopher Hitchens has died. He was 62. He passed away at a hospital in Houston, in Texas, after a long battle, a very public battle, against cancer. Now, Christopher Hitchens began his career in Britain as a left-wing journalist. He then moved on to New York and, to a certain extent, to the political right. Christopher Hitchens was a provocative figure, describing himself as an essayist and contrarian. An author of 17 books, he was an atheist and an alcoholic. If I find that I'm alive in any way at all... Diagnosed with cancer last year, he spoke to Newsnight about his declining health. I'm afraid of a sordid death. I'm afraid that, that I would die in an ugly or squalid way. I mean, cancer can be very pitiless in that. I feel a sense of waste about it um, because I'm not ready. Um, um, I feel a sense of betrayal to my family. He began his career in Britain, moving to New York in the 1980s. His death was announced by Vanity Fair, where he worked as a contributing editor. The magazine said, there will never be another like Christopher, a man of ferocious intellect, who was as vibrant on the page as he was at the bar. Those who read him felt they knew him, and those who knew him were profoundly fortunate souls. Very rapidly expanded. Also paying tribute to him, a fellow author said that Christopher Hitchens could throw words up into the sky, and they fell down in a marvelous pattern. 
So as you can hear, writer Christopher Hitchens uh, died on uh, Thursday from complications from cancer. He was 62, and he's leaving behind 18 books and uh, quite a few essays on politics and public figures. And uh, he was known basically as being a guy who really contested religious, uh, sort of religious fanaticism. He would often be the person to come on to sort of be anti-God if someone else on the program was. And he was an atheist, right, for what it's worth? What's that? He was an atheist, correct? For what he was. Called? He was a, he was an avid atheist, and uh, and basically he uh, they reported about him a lot, and he was often called in by you know news organizations like NPR when you would have some creationist who wanted to make a really solid argument. A lot of times, Hitchens, uh, Christopher Hitchens, would be the man that they called in to basically make the other side of the argument, and so he is uh, he is going on to who knows what as far as he's concerned. <laughs> Isn't, isn't Hitchens the one who called religion the world's most dangerous threat? Correct. Right. Correct. So, you know, as usually, you know, with when people die, you say, oh, they're going on to something or another. Yeah, in his mind, he's going on somewhere. Exactly. And he, he actually called Mother Teresa a fanatic, a fundamentalist, and a fraud. Well, so he, uh, <laughs> it's a atheist, right? Yeah, so he was a, a colorful character, and uh, unfortunately for him, uh, his death was not quite as colorful as his life, but I think that's the best one could hope for. And who else do we have, Fred? Well, what we have is uh, a, a singer, a, actually an opera singer, Cesare Evora, known as the Barefoot Diva, died at 70 years old. She uh, came out of Lisbon, Portugal. He started singing as a teenager in the Bayside Bars of Cape Verde in the 1950s and won a Grammy in 2003 after she took her American Islands of Music to stage across the, across the world. She died Saturday at 70. Uh, Ivana, known as the Barefoot Diva because she always performed without shoes, died in Bautista de Sousa Hospital in Manila, in Manila, her native island of San Vicente in Cape Verde. And uh, you know, she died of a heart attack from open heart surgery, uh, the complication of open heart surgery last year. The second one we have is Susan Gordon, a child actress in the 50s and 60s who died at 62. She starred in Danny Kaye's The Five Pennies, The Twilight Zone, and a live TV version of Miracle on 34th Street. She was a child actress sang with Danny Kaye and Louis Armstrong in the 1959's Five Pennies. And started in the, in the, uh, she died of cancer at, 60, at 62 years old, December 11th, in Teaneck, New Jersey. The golden-haired Gordon was also star. Uh, she, she was in all kinds of in, in all kinds of. They uh, Alfred Hitchcock presents the Dinah Green Show. My three sons has four different characters. There is a photo up of her as a child in the Hollywood Reporter, and we wish her and her family all the best. We wish we we do to our condolences, and that's all I got. And on a lighter note, since you mentioned Teaneck, New Jersey, uh, film critic Leonard Malton, who was or still does reside in Teaneck, New Jersey, uh, just celebrated a birthday this week. Uh, I don't have the number in front of me. I just happen to have read it, 61 or 63, somewhere in that right. age range. Just as since you mentioned Teaneck, I figured I'd give the uh, shout out to Teaneck resident or former resident um, film critic Leonard Malton. Happy birthday. And, and as we wrap things up, just want to remind everybody that you could find us on Facebook. We are BaseNet. On Google Plus, we are BaseNet Internet Television. On Twitter, we are BaseNet TV. Please send in your suggestions, comments, etc., about any of the BaseNet programming to info at basenetintermedia.com. And most importantly, we are always looking for some financial support for all of our programming. Just visit our website, basenettv.com. That's basenettv.com. And you will find a Google checkout link there where you could support all of our programming for as little as $1. Anywhere from $1 on up, you could donate to support our programming and keep us on the air. It's highly appreciated. As of right now, we do not have commercial advertising and commercial support. Not to say that it won't come about in the future. Whether we like it or not, financial support needs to come from somewhere. 
But guys, we have a lot of listeners. If you gave us part of your support, then then have advertisers. Yes, you can do that. Well, you know that. Very good point, friend. Here's my point: if if one person gave five dollars, you pay for what five listeners? I mean, you know, you could you could you could do the math on this. I mean, five dollars will pay for almost a whole month of programming the way we run things around here right now. So you know, just think that little bit of giving you could support all of the programs on BaseNet you like to listen to or see and uh, and give us an opportunity to really bring you some new material. And and make your look at the comparisons. Look at the price of a movie ticket, which is anywhere from nine to twelve dollars or nine to fifteen dollars, depending on where you live. Look at the price of a a coffee at Fred's favorite coffee shop, Starbucks. Uh, you know, give give BaseNet on the low end, give us a dollar. You're not going to buy a cup of coffee anywhere for a dollar. So that's what we ask. So thank you very much. And very good points, Fred and Holly. And from Boston, Massachusetts, at the BaseNet Television Studios, I'm Ed Jupin. And I'm a fan of Swiftwater, Pennsylvania. I'm Fred Boas. And from the Gateway to the West here in St. Louis, I'm Holly Hurley. And have a Merry Christmas if we don't speak to you before then, if you uh, tune into our next show afterwards. And if you're really behind the curve and we don't see you until after the new year, Happy New Year, Happy 2012, everybody. And we'll either see you next week or after the holidays. <laughs>